the December 9th, 2014 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? President Adair. Here. Mr. Ancello. Here. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Barra. Here. Ms. Boyce. Here. Dr. Carbone. Here. Mr. Colby. Here. Mr. Danielli is excused. Mr. Delahanty. Here. Mrs. Draw. Here. Mr. Gamble. Here. Mr. Gamina. Here. Mr. Haney. Here. Mr. Howland. Here. Ms. Cayley. Here. Mr. John Lightfoot. Mr. Willie Lightfoot. Mr. Marionetti. Mr. Michike, Here. Mr. Morelli, Here. Dr. Quattro, Here. Ms. Rivera, Here. Mr. Rocco, Here. Mrs. Stick, Here. Ms. Taylor, Here. Mr. Tucciarello, Here. Mrs. Valerio, Here. Mr. Wilcox, Here. Mr. Yolovich. Folks, please stay seated at this time. It is uh, my honor to introduce to you Reverend Emily Harnett Leifer of the First Unitary Church of Rochester, who has been invited here tonight by Legislator Carrie M. Andrews. Thank you. I invite you into a moment of reverence and prayer. God of holy lightness and sacred darkness, holy companion with us in truth, joy, and sorrow, be with us now. The work of the world is common as mud, poet Marge Piercy reminds us. For the work of the world that is common and brings us together, we pray. We pray, O oh, love beyond all knowing, for all those who have gone before us, the ancestors, mentors, teachers, grandparents, parents, friends, whose vision has brought us here today. Our prayers circle the whole city of Rochester and all of Monroe County. All the bakers, the builders, the managers, the en engineers, the unemployed, the gardeners, the CEOs, the janitors, the snow shovelers. May we do good work. May we know our lives matter. We pray for all those who hold young hands, for parents, for crossing guards, for school bus drivers, for those who shelter and guide the children of our community. We pray for all the decision makers in this room. May our actions be guided by our deepest values, not our deepest fears. May we be the leaders we aspired to be in our youngest years. Amen. Blessed be. May it be so. We, without objection, we will take agenda items number 65 and 66 out of order. Agenda item number 65 is moved by Mr. Tucciaro. It is seconded by Mr. Lightfoot. Will the clerk please read the resolution and memorial for Edwin A. Foster, the former president of the Monroe County Legislature. Expressing regret of the Monroe County Legislature on the recent passing of Edwin A. Foster, former president of the Monroe County Legislature. Be it resolved that the Monroe County Legislature hereby expresses its deep sympathy at the recent passing of Edwin A. Foster, former president of the Monroe County Legislature. And whereas Edwin was a World War II veteran serving our nation in the United States Air Force, he graduated from St. Bonaventure University and then received his law degree from the University of Buffalo Law School. He began work as an attorney in 1953, practicing for most of his life. 
And whereas his dedication to public service began in the town of Parma, where Edwin first served as a town justice, then later as a town councilman, and eventually as the Parma town supervisor. He loved his town and his neighbors, and he cared deeply about their concerns and livelihood. And whereas Edwin was then elected to the Monroe County Legislature, representing Legislative District 1 from 1968 to 1989. During his time in the legislature, he was able to be the voice for the residents of his district, as well as influencing programs and projects across the county. He was also elected by his peers to serve as president of the legislature from 1981 to 1983. And whereas Edwin was devoted to Monroe County in both his professional and elected life, more importantly, he was devoted to his family and his wife, Jeanette, who passed in 2013. Edwin is survived by his children, John, Margaret, Bernadette, Patricia, and grandchildren, Tina, Susan, John, Patrick, Sarah, Justin, Elizabeth, Meredith, Jeanette, Anthony, and Allison, sister-in-law, Doris Foster, and several great-grandchildren. And whereas Edwin A. Foster will be remembered for his dedication to his family, his country, and Monroe County. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature is hereby requested to forward a copy of this resolution to the bereaved family. This resolution was adopted unanimously with each legislator rising in his or her place for a moment of silence. At this time, I will take agenda item number 66 out of order. It is moved by Mr. Petrell. It is seconded by Mr. Lightfoot. Will the clerk please read the resolution in memorial for Derek Smith, husband of Monroe County Attorney Meredith Smith. Expressing regret of the Monroe County Legislature on the recent passing of Derek Smith, husband of County Attorney Meredith Smith. Be it resolved that the Monroe County Legislature hereby expresses its deep sympathy and sorrow at the recent passing of Derek Smith, husband of County Attorney Meredith Smith. And whereas the Rochester community was blessed to know Derek and watch him perform for many years and is now left with a void that is impossible to fill. Derek was known as an immensely talented vocalist and inspirational teacher. In addition to his roles in various theater productions, he performed in Carnegie Hall and in venues around the world. And whereas Derek shared his talents with students at both the Eastman Community Music School and Nazareth College, where he served as a highly respected member of the teaching faculty. During his tenure, he was regarded not only as a qualified instructor, but more importantly, as a kind, caring, supportive, and an excellent teacher. And whereas while Derek was known primarily for his baritone voice and his talents on stage, he was also a devoted family man and a loyal friend. He is survived by his wife, Meredith, their four children, Wyatt, Mimi, Lily, and Julia, and his two brothers, Reggie and Maurice. And whereas, while Derek's family and friends mourn his passing, the entire community shares their sense of loss and reflects on his many meaningful contributions to our community's cultural landscape and his passion for the performing arts. And whereas his legacy is one that commands respect on and off the stage, as his voice continues to be heard by those who knew him well, he will be greatly missed. Be it further resolved that the clerk of the legislature is hereby requested to forward a copy of this resolution to the bereaved family. This resolution was adopted unanimously with each legislator rising in his or her place for a moment of silence. received a copy of the journal of day 11 November 12th 2014 without exception those journals will stand approved as submitted tonight there's a hearing loop in place to assist those who are hearing impaired anyone requesting assistance should inquire in the clerk's office if you have a cellular phone pager or other electronic devices in your possession I would request that you make it inaudible for the duration of the meeting thank you for your cooperation Legislators, the referrals submitted to the legislature for the next committee cycle are in your folders. 
At this time, it is my honor to introduce to you uh, our own Mark Quinn from the Parks Department, who is going to introduce and tell us about the plan of the month. Mark? Thank you. Good evening. The plan of the month this month is no Norfolk Island Pine, like the one in my hand here. Um, Norfolk Island Pines are obviously not a native. They're, a, they're actually a tropical uh, from Norfolk Island, which is off the coast of Australia. So they won't grow very well in your yard, but they're a wonderful house plant. It's uh, very interesting. They show up in every grocery store and every garden center this time of year, and people will buy them for, uh, for indoor Christmas trees, although they don't hang ornaments very well. You've got to put light, light stuff on them. But in their native environment, they can get to be up to 200 feet tall. In your house, however, they can stay in the size that you, we see up front here for years and years, maybe even decades. Uh, what you want to do with these things, if you want to keep them as a house plant after, after Christmas, is just keep them in the pot. They don't take a lot of care. They like a little humidity. You might want to put some mist on them. In the, in the winter, you can let them dry out. In the summer, best thing to do is just put them out in the yard, um, and they'll do fine outside and bring them back in before the frost. They, they won't take a, a frost, but they'll take a nice cool room in the house. They're relatively tolerant. You can, if they get a little bit of light, they'll, they'll limp along all winter long, and you can have them year after year. Again, if you want them bigger, if you want the one in my hand to be that one, in the growing season, you actually fertilize them a few times with a, a soluble fer fertilizer. If you don't want them bigger, if you want them to stay house size for you, just leave them in the same pot for many years, maybe three, four, five years. Um, and don't fertilize them, just give them regular watering, and they'll do very well as a house plant. They're more tolerant than a lot of the house plants we, we have going. So after Christmas, take the ornaments off. They'll do great in your house. Thanks. Mark, thank you. This evening we have several proclamations scheduled. Madam Clerk. Would David Lee Farrell please come forward? Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and Legislator Carla F. Boyce. Whereas the American Red Cross is a 133-year-old organization dedicated to life-saving services and programs. It provides outreach and assistance all over the world to those affected by disaster and makes domestic contributions to hospitals and other medical entities. The Red Cross is only able to exist as a result of the people who volunteer their time and donate their blood. And whereas David Farrell is one of these people, David has gone above and beyond the, life, the average lifetime contribution. Less than 10% of eligible donors in the United States have ever donated, and the majority of those who regularly donate usually only do so once or twice a year. This past October, David donated his 801st unit. And whereas, David's milestones placed him in an elite group of donors. He has donated both whole units of blood, which can save up to three separate lives, as well as blood platelets, which are used to prevent blood clots during surgery. He makes roughly 24 donations a year, consistently visiting the John Street facility in Henrietta every two weeks. And whereas there is no doubt that David's contributions have saved hundreds of lives and assisted in countless relief efforts, it is a privilege to have such a giving gentleman who has affected lives in the entire world living within our community. Now, therefore, we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, and Carla F. Boyce, Legislator, District 5, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize and congratulate David Lee Farrell and thank him for his selfless donations. Congratulations. I never expected to receive any kind of uh, recognition like this for my going in and doing what has become for me something that I do every two weeks except when they tell me I can't donate anymore that year. I would encourage everyone who is able or willing to donate to the Red Cross, whether it's whole blood or whether it's platelets. Only the human body right now can make the products that come from what uh, the donors give to the Red Cross. 
or to other blood collection agencies. So thank you for the recognition. And I would certainly ask that everyone consider donating to the Red Cross when and as you're able. Thank you. Representatives from the Pittsburgh Women's Varsity Swim Team, please come forward. Also, President Jeffrey R. Adair and legislators John Howland and Carla Ackworth. Whereas Section 5 Athletics has organized and facilitated high school sports in Monroe County and the surrounding area since 1923. Annual competitions between the best teams of the season are both demanding and intense and require each team's full effort. And whereas the Pittsburgh Panthers swim team won the Class A title for Section 5 this year, succeeding over the neighboring teams of Webster and Fairport. As a team, they impressively won the first six of 11 events and individual women defended their titles and swam personal best. And whereas this year's victory marks the 13th consecutive Class A win for the team, the dedication to the sport, sometimes a year-long commitment, is embraced by the swimmers and coaches alike. And whereas these young women have proven the payoff of hard work and defended an impressive record for their town and school, each of them has a bright future ahead. Monroe County is proud to have this successful team representing our community. Now, therefore, we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, Anthony Danielli, Vice President, Carla F. Boyce, Legislator District 5, and John Howland, Legislator District 13, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby recognize and congratulate Pittsburgh Women's Varsity Swim Team on their 13th consecutive Class A state title. Thank you, it's such an honor. Um, we all worked hard for it and it was great to see it all pay off. Would James Lawrence please come forward, also President Jeffrey R. Adair and legislators Willie Lightfoot and Cindy Cayley. Whereas, James Lawrence is a veteran journalist whose career has spanned the past 42 years. He has been editorial page editor for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle the past 22 years. And whereas, Lawrence's first job upon graduation from Howard University was with the Cleveland Call and Post, a black weekly newspaper that continues to operate. Following that, he spent time as a reporter for United Press International in Denver as a member of the editorial board at his hometown newspaper the Orlando Sentinel in Orlando and as editor at Gannett Suburban Newspapers in White Plains. 
And whereas during his career, he has won numerous awards and currently his team has been nominated for a coveted Pulitzer Prize for its Unite Rochester campaign, which deals with race and economic inequities. Last spring, he won Gannett's National Diversity Award for his work on the Unite Rochester campaign. In October, Lawrence was presented with his first Lifetime Achievement Award for his work over the past two decades. And whereas Jim is married to Betty Lawrence, a library executive, and they have three adult children and seven grandchildren. He is a, memory of, he is a member of the advisory board at Northeastern Seminary in Rochester and is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. The Lawrences are members of Baber African Methodist Episcopal Church in Rochester, where he serves on the steward board and is a member of the male chorus. Now, therefore, we, Jeffrey R. Adair, President, Willie J. Lightfoot, Assistant Minority Leader, Carrie M. Andrews, Minority Leader, and Cynthia W. Cayley, Assistant Minority Leader, on behalf of the entire Monroe County Legislature, do hereby honor James Lawrence for his dedication to journalism on the occasion of his retirement. Congratulations. If I may, thank you, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, good evening, and I want to thank, first and foremost, Almighty God, because it is he that has allowed me to do great and unexpected things, and this, indeed, is one of those unexpected things that I'm very, very grateful for. After all, I never imagined, never imagined, I'd be the subject of a proclamation by the Monroe County Legislature. <laughs> Certainly not one that is as flattering and humbling as this one. So my thanks to Legislator Willie Lightfoot and Legislator Kayla and to Carrie Andrews, Minority Leader, for all getting the ball rolling. And a special thanks as well to Legislature President Jeff Adair. Jeff? All right. <laughs> and to Majority Leader, leader uh, Steve Tucciarelli. Thank you, Steve. And finally, my thanks to each and every one of you who are members of this august body. Over the years, I don't need to say this, but over the years, we've had our differences. I hear a few chuckles out over there. <laughs> but what's been good about it, we've always been respectful of one another. Our opinions clearly have differed in how we think things ought to be done, but they were always respectful. And that's something that we try to do on the editorial page. And whenever we talk about the, legis the county legislature or any legislative body or any topic that we try to, to tackle, we had our point of view and certainly others had theirs. But we were always respectful. There was respectful dialogue. There is just simply too little, in my opinion, too little of that respectful dialogue in our country and in our communities. No better example has been the reaction to the recent grand jury decisions in the Michael Brown case and the Eric Garner case. People typically reacted uh, angrily along racial lines, often refusing to listen to one another's point of view. When that happens, nothing, nothing changes. So it's no wonder that 50 years after the Rochester riots, 50 years after the Rochester riots, we see many of the same conditions that existed then are still prevalent in our community. And in some cases, they're even worse. So in this community where Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony threw down the gauntlet as change agents, we have to follow in their footsteps. After all, we know that this community can do better, we must do better, 
It's in our DNA to do better. This is one reason why the Democrat and Chronicle has been among those at the forefront in a push for addressing racial and economic inequities as the focus of our Unite Rochester campaign for over the past two years. The work we've been doing has been among the most rewarding for me personally as a journalist for 42 plus years. Increasingly, leaders like yourselves are recognizing that we're, we can't continue on the path that we're on. They've been meeting in big groups and small groups and devising a new way forward. Most recently, they responded to our call for action just last week. More than 25 top decision makers and community activists gathered at the DNC to devise a strategy to calm emotions in the wake of the racially charged grand jury decisions. They came up with the idea of a United, Unite Rochester pledge which was published on Sunday on the editorial page. The pledge, if you didn't see it, it reads, I acknowledge the challenges encountered along racial and economic lines in our community and pledge to overcome our differences and disagreements in a way that unites us. I will seek to engage in constructive and direct conversations with those who think differently. And I pledge that my conversations and actions will respect the dignity of all those in, greater, in the greater Rochester community. Finally, I believe our unity will ultimately bring us together and result in meaningful change for our region. And I might add that uh, among the signees was our county executive, Maggie Brooks. So, I really appreciate the opportunity to stand before you, but in closing, I would hope that you would join us in our Unite Rochester campaign. It's, it's a worthwhile start to getting the conversation going for many who haven't been involved so far. At Unite Rochester, we have at least a half dozen committees and subcommittees in the areas of jobs, criminal justice, housing, education, and we could use your help. We could use your help. So keep in mind, we're not against a, we're not a, a city problem. It's not a, a democratic problem. It's not a Republican problem. It's a community-wide problem. And it's gonna take the entire community, all of us, black, white, Hispanic, Native American, it's gonna take all of us working together to correct problems that have been too prevalent for far too long. So I ask you to please join us and help us to pull together so that we can be the change that we wanna see. I can be reached, I'll be staying on for, for those of you who think I was just going away, I'm not going away. I'm, I will be staying on as a vo volunteer with Unite Rochester, uh, helping to uh, coordinate and, and really just keep, keep the ball rolling because the ball, the momentum is really picking up. We want to we wanna ensure that it continues to pick up. So if you want to reach me, you can do so uh, through the paper or you can see me afterwards. I can give you my uh, uh, email address. So thank you for, uh, I took a little bit more than three minutes, uh, but I really had something to say, and I do appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, stand before you. So God bless you, and let's unite Rochester. We will now recess for the purpose of holding several public hearings. I declare open the public hearing on local law intro number 399 of 2014.
entitled Authorizing Leasing of Supply Property at 2449 East Paul Boulevard, or I'm sorry, St. Paul Boulevard in the town of Arondequoit, New York to the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Monroe County. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare the public hearing closed and open the public hearing for local law intro number 402 of 2014 entitled Authorizing the Sale of Surplus Property on Brew Road in the Town of Riga, New York to the County of Monroe to the County of Monroe Industrial Development Agency and transfer of proceeds. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare open the public hearing. Um, there being none, I declare this public hearing closed and open the public resolution hearing on intro number 422 of 2014 entitled Amending Increase and Improvement of Facilities in the Rochester Pure Waters District, Combined Sewer Overflow Abatement Program, Pedestrian Bridge Improvements, Authorizing Contract with CP Ward for Construction Services at Rochester Pure Water District, Combined Sewer Overflow Abatement Program, Pedestrian Bridge and Improvement Project. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare the public hearing closed and reconvene the December 9th, 2014 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature. At this time, I will recess the legislature to hold a public hearing before the Pure Waters Administration Board. I declare open the public hearing on a resolution entitled Establishing Scale of Charges for the Pure Rochester Pure Waters District, a county sewer district in the county of Monroe. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare the public hearing closed. I declare open the public hearing and resolution entitled Establishing Scale of Charges for the Irondequoit Bay South Central Pure Waters District, a county sewer district in the county of Monroe, New York. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare this public hearing closed. I declare open the public hearing and resolution entitled Establishing Scale of Charges for the Northwest Quadrant Pure Waters District, a county sewer district for the county of Monroe, New York. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare this public hearing closed. I declare the open the public hearing resolution entitled Establishing Scale of Charges for the Gates Charlie Ogden Sewer District, a county sewer district in the county of Monroe, New York. There are no speakers registered for this hearing. There being none, I declare this public hearing closed and reconvene the December 9, 2014 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature. If you have in your folders the approved minutes from the last cycle, there are no formal committee reports scheduled for this evening. At this time, we will now hold a public forum. We have several people registered to address the legislature. Madam Clerk. If you require assistance, a deputy is available to assist you in approaching the lectern. I will call three people forward at one time. Each speaker will have two minutes in which to address the legislature and kindly conclude your remarks when the timer sounds and exit through the back of the chambers. Thank you for your cooperation. Our first three speakers will be Jonathan Siegel, Arthur Doughton, and Mary Ellen Belding. Okay. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Siegel. I am a resident of Brighton, an owner of a small business, Meliora researcher, and a participant in free facing race, embracing equity. I'm here to request this legislature to restore the cuts in child care assistance in the county executive's proposed budgets. There are several reasons for this. The cuts fall primarily on low-income residents of our community who want what we all want to, want to work, get an education, and be responsible towards their children. Why would you want to balance the budget on their backs? The future of businesses like mine depend on the investments we make today in our children, the future workers, consumers, and leaders of our community. Reducing our investment in child care is a profound indication that we do not care about our economic future or the health of businesses like mine. Much has been made about blaming Albany for these cuts, call Albany, we are told. How can we demand Albany act when we ourselves don't rise to the challenge? It's better by far to meet the challenge ourselves. More broadly, these cuts are the result of a budgeting process that needs to be fixed before we repeat and rinse in 2015. It provides an adequate opportunity for public participation and deliberation, particularly on the part of those who are not connected to the political process or to things like Unite. We do not have an explicit racial equity impact assessment in the budgeting process that would allow us to determine how our proposed budget affects equity. This is not a dream, by the way. Other communities do it. 
I think most of us in this room tonight know how you would decide, though we would all love to be pleasantly surprised. But this issue, and more broadly, the issues of justice and equity and power in this community will not die, will not be decided by groups of 25 people or leaders in that fight. Well, that fight will continue in 2015 and in 2017 and every year as long as it takes for justice to come. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the Morrow County Legislature and uh, fellow neighbors in the public. On Saturday, the November 29, 2014, at about 2.15 p.m., I stood in a cold parking lot of 1515 West Ridge Road in Greece behind the Red Lobster, listening to a story about 200 people who came to Monroe County in New York to celebrate Thanksgiving weekend in 1978. These 200 people came from all over the United States and Canada to visit family, friends, schoolmates, and to bargain hunt at the uh, Greasetown Mall. Many also planned to attend the dance later on the 25th of November. One of the families that came is the Sundry family, consisting of a grandmother, a daughter, an aunt from Ontario, Canada. This family came shopping for the weekend to buy Christmas gifts, and incidentally, they also came with their dancing shoes. On the morning of the 26th of November at 2, 2 a.m., people were awakened at the Holiday Inn with noise of, of people screaming, running down the hallways to get out of, the, ho of the, uh, the hotel, and some were still sleeping. Within an hour, the Holiday Inn was nearly destroyed by fire. Ten visitors were laying in, on the blacktop in the parking lot with plastic covering their bodies. Party dresses, dancing shoes, and Christmas gifts were all gone, and many family members were lost, lost, lost their lives. I come here tonight to ask you to pay tribute to these 200 people, their names, their family members, and the, lost, the ones they lost, ones uh, here below is the list I handed in to the legislature here. In addition, I am requesting that the future Thanksgiving holidays, starting with 2015 and beyond, that this honorable body issue a proclamation honoring them. We also need to pay tribute to the first responders who both from the county and from the city fire department who put their lives in danger to save so many people while carrying out the ones that were dead. I have personally met the first responders uh, particularly Brian Sondry, who drove all the way down to Monroe County from Ottawa, Canada, and carries the scars of this tragic Thanksgiving weekend. I will end by saying, since this is one of the worst of fires, uh, um, loss of life in, in uh, fire in Monroe County, I feel we should, we should continue to remember this tragic event. Finally, thank you for the opportunity to share this story with you tonight. Starting in 2015, it is my hope of, uh, that you will, will find it within your hearts to grant my request to briefly honor these families who lost their lives. And I thank you for the extra time. Our next three speakers are Mary Ellen Belding, Hassana Martin, and Phyllis Moss. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> it's been about a year, I guess, since I spoke to you before about the um, cuts in the daycare subsidy. And at that time, I shared my story about how I adopted three beautiful boys through the foster care unit at Monroe, um, of Monroe County. Um, and I remember when my oldest son was in first grade, I was working in the human services community at that time and I learned that if a child was not engaged in the educational process by third grade was not reading that a jail cell was technically built for them and they were lost and um, would most likely end up in jail and that and I panicked 
pulled my child out. I want to report to you that my child is doing really well. And I'm very grateful for the daycare subsidies that um, were provided to me and my family and that the daycare workers have been very instrumental in helping me to raise three African-American males by myself. But I'm not here to talk to you about my children today. I'm here to talk to you about the children that I work with because I want to tell you that it's worse than I thought, that I work for BOCES now. And if a child comes into kindergarten not having any free um, kindergarten um, support, then that child comes in not knowing their ABCs, not knowing their colors, not knowing their shapes, that they come in already behind the eight ball. And most of the time they have behavior problems. And so I wanna ask you if you would reconsider the daycare subsidies because it takes a village to raise a child. And we're not, it's not just about the money, we're investing in our children so that maybe we can um, not be the fourth poorest community in the country at some point. I want to end by saying that when I was resource manager of the Emergency Services and Family Stabilization Network, one of the things that we learned is that more than 80% of the people that were coming into our doors for assistance were people that had a high school education or less. So we have to invest in our children so that they can be self-sufficient. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Donna Jekyll, Hector Vargas, and Jeff Kazarowski. Hi, my name is Donna Jackal, and um, I'm a taxpayer, Monroe County taxpayer who lives in Brighton. Um, and um, I would first like to acknowledge that the state of New York bears a great deal of responsibility in paying for daycare subsidies for uh, the children who will be running our, our country tomorrow, and uh, that they should be giving more money than they are currently. This, the, so um, I wanted to kind of uh, start by just talking about an article I saw in the Democrat and Chronicle today that said no surprises expected in Monroe County budget. And um, uh, the county executive uh, said an increase in state money more than offset the county's cut and that families who receive subsidies would not feel a pinch. And she was referring to the $600,000 being cut. Um, but you know when but who's getting pinched um, the the um, sorry here um, in, in most par parts of New York State including Monroe County subsidies have become less available over the past several years from 2007 to 2013 the number of subsidies dropped in 38 of New York's 57 counties with an average decline of 27 percent so um, we, we uh, Monroe County did get 1.74 million in state money for the next budget year for subsidized daycare slots. Um, and so that's what she was referring to that would have offset the 600,000 in county cuts. But if only 22% of families that qualify for subsidized, day, sorry, subsidized daycare in Monroe County are actually receiving it. So they're feeling the pinch. And uh, additionally, uh, a re new report from the Center for Governmental Research uh, said that the need for subsidized daycare is, uh, uh, daycare is growing quickly in, the su in our suburbs. The number of children uh, who need subsidized daycare has increased to 52% in Irondequoit, 31% in Henrietta, and 17% in Greece. And that's from uh, 2000 to 2008 to 12. So um, thank you very much for listening to me. Sorry about all the numbers. Uh, I'm here representing the Sunblock Club and the Northeast Neighborhood Community Council. 
I am here on behalf of all the children and residents in the 14621 neighborhood. 14621 has the highest number of level three sex offenders in Monroe County. According to the data found on the citydata.com website, the same website that the Rochester City School District uses to monitor and alert parents that have access to the internet. Again, those parents in Rochester that have access to the internet, to the number of sex offenders in a particular zip code. We have been monitoring sex offenders coming into and out of 14621 since 2013 through the criminal justice New York.gov, New York Alert website. We have discovered that the majority of sex offenders coming into and out of our community are coming from the St. Francis Center at 547 Joseph Avenue in the 14621 zip code, a block away from 14621. 14605 has 55 registered sex offenders. 14621 zip code has 145 level three registered sex offenders. Monroe County has 279 level three registered sex offenders. You add up the math. They came from the surrounding counties, prisons to Monroe County Jail to the St. Francis Center, 214621. This has created a cluster of level two and three sexually violent and predicate, predicate sex offenders on North Clinton Avenue. The cluster extends from North Clinton Avenue and Avenue D to North Clinton Avenue and Resolute Street. There's a high concentration cluster of level three of sex offenders in the area of North, of North Clinton Avenue and Resolute Street. This area is within a thousand feet of school number 50. We are concerned that the current New York State Sex Offender Registry Restriction Law was not enforced and is not currently being enforced. If you want to find out more, check out the Parsons.net website. We have reached out to the Monroe County Parole and Probation, and we are still waiting. It's been two years. We have reached out to the St. Francis Center, and we are still waiting. We agree with the new legislation and law that has been tabled. We agree that Monroe County needs to establish and expand New York State Sex Offender Restriction Laws. But what we are concerned about is that we have a large concentration of level three sex offenders in 14621 and around our schools and charter schools. We are concerned that we will be grandfathered in and our issues will not be resolved or alleviated. We would like to see Monroe County legislators come together to address this issue, this much needed legislation before this much needed legislation becomes a law. We don't want to get rid of all level three sex offenders in 14621. But how, but how about if we just get fair share within the county? Equality and fairness is all we are asking for. We have been asking for this for over 50 years, since the 1964 riots, and we still are just asking for equality and justice for all residents in Monroe County. Thank you. Thank you, President Adair. I'm Jeff Kazarowski. I'm a pediatrician, and I am the president of the Children's Agenda. Each year, we conduct an analysis of the Monroe County budget. Last week at uh, the Ways and Means Committee meeting, my colleague Bridget Hurley uh, spoke about our recommendations, and legislators have received a copy of our summary and report. We uh, remain concerned about reductions in funding to child care and the Youth Family Partnership and we want to ensure that the new model of care for Starlight Pediatrics meets and exceeds the accepted standards of care for the very vulnerable children in foster care. But more broadly, uh, we at the Children's Agenda are concerned about how to meet the needs of children and families in our community in 2015 and beyond. And there are three key points and um, one solution uh, that we're gonna recommend or offer. The first point is that um, Recent reports from the United Way and the Community Foundation indicate there are more families in our community who are struggling to make ends meet. The Rochester Business Journal had an article on July 31st of this year that says uh, now there are more families living in poverty in the suburbs of Monroe County than in the city of Rochester. And the information you heard about the Center for Governmental Research report on child care echoes that. Second uh, key point is that uh, we are increasingly recognized that solutions that are good for kids and families are good for business and good for our economy. If you look at issues like childcare, if you look at issues like early education and care, if you look at preventive services, these are all things that put into place effectively save taxpayers money downstream and promote our economy and promote uh, the business interests of our community. The third thing is actually we're, uh, we're a community that develops solutions to problems 
reflect those needs. We developed the Nurse Family Partnership Program and the Building Healthy Children Program here in Monroe County. We have some of the highest quality center-based child care in the United States for four-year-olds in Monroe County because of the innovation in this community. So the disconnect is between those needs and that innovation and uh, the creativity and the recognition that we have that this is important for our community as a whole. So to summarize, I just say uh, we ask that the county engage in a multi-year plan for economic, uh, just as the county engages in multi-year plans for economic development, that we start to engage in a multi-year plan, please, for children and families. We envision that a bipartisan private-public commission should engage creative solutions, identify new funding mechanisms, and integrate services. And it could have particular areas of focus like child care subsidies, effective preventive programs, and early care and education. The county can lead this because these issues are countywide, and many of these issues are under its purview. We can do better for kids and families in Monroe County. I don't have any questions about that, but we need new mechanisms and new infrastructures and a new systemic way to approach that. And that's what we're really here to ask the legislature uh, to focus on today. Thank you. Our final two speakers again are Mary Ellen Belding and Hassana Martin. This concludes the public forum. At this time, we'll recess the December 9, 2014 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature and convene the Pure Waters Administration Board for the Rochester Pure Waters District, the Rondequoit Bay South Central Pure Waters District, the Northwest Quadrant, and the Gates Charlie Ogden Sewer Districts regarding referral number 14-0318 for the purposes of establishing scale of charges for each district and adopting Pure Waters, additional Pure Waters items. The clerk will please note the attendance and read the first item on the agenda. Okay, we have agenda item one, referral 14-0318, providing. It's moved by Legislator Mitch Kade, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to lift from the table. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Okay, we have agenda item two, referral 14-0318. Moved by Legislator Mitch Kade, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. PWAB agenda item three, referral 14-0356. Moved by Legislator Marinetti, seconded by Legislator Michike and Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. Item number, or PWEB agenda item number four, referral 14-0365. Moved by Legislator Mitch K, the second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item. PWEB agenda item number five, referral 14-0368. Moved by Legislator Mitch K and is seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. PWAB agenda item number six, referral 14-0318. It is moved by Legislator Mitch K and is seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is the motion to lift from the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. PWEB agenda item number seven, referral 14-0318. It is moved by Legislator Mitch K, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. PWEB agenda item number eight, referral 14-0356. Moved by Legislator Marinetti, is seconded by Legislators Mitch K and Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. PWAB agenda item number nine, referral 14-0368. Moved by Legislator Mitch K, is seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. QF agenda item number 10, referral 14-0318. Moved by Legislator Mitchell Kay, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to lift from the table. All in favor? Any opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. QF agenda item number 11, referral 14-0318. It is moved by Legislator Mitch Kate, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. QAB agenda item number 12, referral 14-0356. Moved by Legislator Marinetti, seconded by Legislators Mitch Kate and Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. QWeb agenda item number 13, referral 14-0368. Moved by Legislator Mitchell Kay, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. QWeb agenda item number 14, referral 14-0318. Moved by Legislator Mitch Kay, is second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to lift from the table. All in favor? Opposed? The item carries. Next item. QWeb agenda item number 15, referral 14-0318. It is moved by Legislator Mitch Kay, is second by Legislator Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor? Say aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. QWeb agenda item number 16, referral 14-0356. Moved by Legislator Marinetti, second by Legislators Mitch K. and Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. QWeb agenda item number 17, referral 14-0361. Moved by, moved by Legislator Mitch K. It is seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. QWeb agenda item 18, referral 14-0368. Moved by Legislator Mitch K. It is seconded by Legislator Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an 18. We will now. I started getting ahead of myself there. We will now re recess the Gates Ogden Sewer District Northwest Quadrant Pure Waters District, Hirondequoit Bay South Central Pure Waters District, and the Rochester Pure Waters District and adjourn the Pure Waters Administration Board. The December 9th, 2014 meeting of the Monroe County Legislature is reconvened. We will now proceed with considerations of local laws. Will the clerk please read the first item on the agenda? Item number one, referral 14-0307. Moved by Legislator Rocco, seconded by Legislators Valerio and Yolovich. This is the motion to lift from the table. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, the item carries. Next item, please. Item number two, referral 14-0307. Moved by Legislator Rocco, second by Legislators Valerio and Yolovich. This is the motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number three, referral 14-0312. Moved by Legislator Rocco, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is the motion to lift from the table. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number four, referral 14-0312. Moved by Legislator Rocco, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion? Legislator Tucciarello. Yes, I, I would like to rise to... Uh, Offer an amendment to this, please. Um, we've received a memo from uh, Mr. Napier. Well, I need a second first of all, please. Thank you. Uh, we received a memo from Mr. Napier on the subject matter, which adds a property missing in the original referral 
land was included in the total acreage, but the actual property address was missing in the referral, I would request that we amend this resolution to include 280 Brew Road. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a move and a second. I'll wait for legislators to see. Okay, is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. The amendment carries. Back to the main motion. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Well, thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> While I have while I will vote to support the sale of the property, I have very serious concerns about the uh, proposal to transfer the proceeds from the sale of the property to the county general fund. Therefore, I wish to offer an amendment, uh, and I will wait for that amendment to be distributed. The motion was made by Legislator Haney. The second came from Legislator Wilcox. Thank you. Amendment is being passed along. The amendment, Mr. President, uh, basically strikes section three of, of the proposed. Uh, of the proposal before us. Uh, by striking section three, uh, the proceeds of the sale would not be transferred from the solid waste fund to the general fund, uh, but would remain in the solid waste fund. Uh, the reason I'm moving to strike this is because I think it is financially very inappropriate to engage in what we're about to engage in. Uh, at the end of 2013, the Solid Waste Fund had an unrestricted fund deficit of $18,097,000. It's been growing consistently uh, year to year. Uh, and in some years has grown by three or four million dollars. Uh, I've asked repeatedly for how the county uh, administration plans to propose uh, to address this uh, ever-mounting and seriously large deficit in the solid waste fund, and I've not received any response to those requests other than um, to say that s several Proposals are being reviewed or discussed or looked at or something. But no, um, there's been no evidence as, as to any specific proposal. I think it would be highly inappropriate, seeing that the Solid Waste Fund is burdened uh, with this very large deficit, to transfer the, um, the proceeds from this sale to the general fund. Uh, now, I know why uh, Section 3 is in the ordinance. Section 3 is in the ordinance because the administration uh, seeks to use this as a vehicle for partially bailing out the general fund, uh, which uh, has its own financial difficulty. But the funds are supposed to stand on their own, Mr. President, <coughs> and to to take a million three hundred and sixty nine thousand dollars from the solid waste fund when it has a huge existing deficit, uh, I think is highly in inappropriate. Um, 
the result of this will actually worsen the deficit in the solid waste fund because this land is undoubtedly on the books of the solid waste fund at some, uh, at some value related to whatever the purchase price was. And in selling the land, the land value will have to be written off in the solid waste waste fund so that we aren't just transferring the net gain on the sale to the general fund, we're transferring 100% of the proceeds of the sale uh, to the general fund. So that not only are we not using this as an opportunity to uh, favorably impact the solid waste fund, but we're actually making the situation in the solid waste fund worse as the uh, write-off of the value of the land uh, will produce a loss in the solid waste fund. So, Mr. President, I think it is highly inappropriate to transfer this money to the general fund. And my baseline fear is that at some point, the users of the, so uh, of the mill seat landfill, those citizens of this county whose refuse is currently trucked to mill seat, and those are primarily city residents and west side re town residents, are going to get socked with a huge bill uh, for addressing that deficit. And that bill could be ameliorated uh, if, we kept the pro if we kept the proceeds uh, of the sale in the solid waste fund. So, Mr. Chairman, I move the, as I say, I move the amendment, and I would sincerely hope that the legislature uh, would support the adoption of the amendment. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, I'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Tuturello. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Mr. Baroff. Ms. Boyce, Dr. Carbone, Mr. Colby, Mr. Danielli is excused, Mr. Delahanty, Mrs. Draw, Mr. Gamble, Mr. Gamina, Mr. Haney, Mr. Howland, Ms. Cayley, Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot. Yes. Mr. Marionetti. Yes. Mr. Michike. Mr. Morelli. Dr. Quattro. Ms. Rivera. Mr. Rocco. Mrs. Stick. Ms. Taylor. Mrs. Valerio. Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Yolovich. Yes. President Adair. No. Nine to 18, amendment fails. Back to the main motion. Is there any discussion? Legislator Brock. Thank you, Mr. President. I just have one quick brief question to the administration um, regarding the addition of the 280 Bowie Road uh, to the um, referral. Am I correct to assume through the uh, president that there is no, in fact, uh, difference other than the inclusion of the title, i.e. the assessed value, the price, all that remains constant? For you, Mr. President, that's correct. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on item number four? Seeing none, this is on a main motion. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Opposed? Roll call vote. I was going to try to just to argue the position of the vice president. So. Roll call vote. Sorry. On the main motion, Mr. Tuturello. Yes. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Yes. Mr. Baroff. Yes. Ms. Boyce. Yes. Dr. Carbone. Yes. Mr. Colby. Yes. Mr. Danielli is excused. Mr. Delahanty. Yes. Mrs. Draw. Mr. Gamble, 
Mr. Gamina. Mr. Haney. Mr. Howland. Ms. Cayley. Mr. John Lightfoot. Mr. Willie Lightfoot. Mr. Marionetti. Mr. Michike. Mr. Morelli. Dr. Quattro. Ms. Rivera. Mr. Rocco. Mrs. Stick. Ms. Taylor. Mrs. Valerio. Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Yolovich. President Adair. 18 to 9, resolution passes. Next item, please. Item number five, referral 14 0369. Moved by Legislator Rocco, second by Legislators Valerio and Yolovich. This is for introductory purposes only. Next item. Item number six, referral 14 0369. It is moved by Legislator Rocco, second by Legislators Valerio and Yolovich. This is a motion to table. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number seven, referral 14 0369. Moved by Legislators Rocco, second by Legislators Valerio and Yolovich. This is a motion to set the public hearing. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. We will now proceed with considerations of motions, resolutions, and notices. Will the clerk please read the next item on the agenda? Item number eight, referral 14-0301. It is moved by Legislator Mitchell Cade, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to lift from the table. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Item number nine. I'm sorry, it's your spot. Item number nine, referral 14-0301. Moved by Legislator Mitchell Case, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 10, referral 14-0301-BR. Moved by Legislator Mitchell Case, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 11, referral 14 0317. Moved by Legislator Mitch Cade, second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to lift from the table. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 12, referral 14 0317. Uh, moved by Legislator Mitchell Cade, is second by Legislator Yolovich. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 13, referral 14 0371. It is moved by Legislator Yolovich, is second by Legislator Rocco. This is a motion to lift from the table. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 14, referral 14-0371. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, is a second by Legislator Rocco. This is a motion to adopt. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Cayley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to move to amend the budget to restore daycare funding, and uh, the amendment will be distributed now. Second by Legislator Gamble. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, and to the legislature, 
I, I feel that I offer this, this amendment um, that we need to establish uh, our priorities, the county's priorities. When this budget was unveiled, we listened in earnest and um, we were told that priorities were being set. But the priorities were more for infrastructure and administrative and less for caring for the community itself. Short term in goals instead of long term in goals and eventually savings in both um, health concerns of our residents as well as savings down the road for health costs. The priorities have been stated that it was the most important thing that we keep the flat tax rate. I disagree. Since uh, the tax rate may be flat, we've not really kept anything flat. Our tax bills have gone up. But in, in terms of daycare and the funding that we've lost, I still feel that the priorities are not what the majority of the community wants and I would represent them in saying that local daycare funding has been steadily, the funding for it has been steadily decreasing. It is unacceptable and Monroe County is only serving 22% of the po potentially eligible children. We are told that we are doing a maintenance of effort but when you receive a large block of funding from the state and then you take away additional funding in that same year, you robbed Peter to pay Paul in a different way. We could have made a great difference, we still can make a great difference in the number of children that we impact and their futures. It's been stated by the speakers that have been here, the articles that have been written in the paper. The need is often defined as a city problem due to the highest need in the county being at the city. However, according to a report from the Center, Center for Governmental Research, the need for subsidies is countywide, not just in the city. In order to restore funding to child care subsidies, we propose, we propose ending the needless leases of parking lots in the county that we have continually stated, uh, or have been continually stated, that they might develop them someday. That was the same argument used for using Pure Water's money and uh, adjusting the rates that I pay as a city person. That's just a personal note. The result of ending these leases would um, end up in a savings of $789,000 plus, and that would not only restore the proposed cut to daycare funding, but increase the funding and number of children potentially served in 2015. And so it's with these thoughts and these facts that I ask the legislature as a whole to adopt this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the amendment? Okay, Dakota Haynes. Mr. Chairman, the adoption of the amendment. Uh, as the county executive said a month ago when she presented her proposed budget to us, budgets are statements of priorities. Here we have a clear choice of priority. We can either continue to pay out a sizable amount of money every year to rent two parcels of property in West Main Street of which I've never been given any logical reason as to what potential value the rental of those lots has to the county. I mean, the county first became involved in the lots because that's where the new uh, 12 years or so ago, it was contemplated that that's where the new Damon NCC campus would, would, would be built. And to, as, as, as a, to say that they are a priority over and above daycare for the chil for children of this county I think it's, it's just preposterous. Daycare, I want to stress, is not a city issue. Studies have documented that childhood poverty is increasing rapidly in the towns, especially the inner ring towns. This is an issue for the entire county. It is not a city issue. 
I would urge some of my colleagues to contact their school districts, for example, to see how the number of children who are eligible for free and reduced price uh, fe lunches under the federal uh, lunch program are increasing dramatically in districts like East Arundiquite, Rush Henrietta, Greece, Gates Chilar, the number of children in recent years eligible for free and reduced price lunches has increased dramatically. We're not talking about school lunches here, we're talking about daycare. We certainly are talking about day, daycare. Thank you, on the point of order, uh, Mr. Haney, continue your, your discussion, and right. wrap it up. I only cite that situation as evidence, documented e e evidence, that, that the problem of poverty has gone well beyond the city line. It is a countywide issue. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we deny most, uh, so many of these children, the majority, are being raised in single parent households. And when that single parent is not able to get daycare for their child, it frequently means that the single parent can't work. And when the single parent can't work, the single parent then ends up on, on welfare. It is pound, it, it's, it just is not, it's penny wise and pound foolish to be saying that we're saving money by reducing subsidies for daycare. Because what we're doing is forcing po additional families into poverty and we're forcing additional families ultimately onto the welfare rolls because that single parent who now has to stay home to care for their child or children cannot work and cannot support themselves. So I would hope that my colleagues, recognizing a serious problem, uh, would join in supporting my colleagues' amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Hearing none on the amendment, I'll move to a roll call vote. On the amendment, Mr. Tucciarello. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Mr. Baroff. Ms. Boyce. Dr. Carbone. Mr. Colby. Mr. Daniele is excused. Mr. Delahanty. Mrs. Draw. Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gamina. Mr. Haney. Mr. Howland. Ms. Cayley. Mr. John Lightfoot. Mr. Willie Lightfoot. Mr. Marionetti. Mr. Michike. Mr. Morelli. Dr. Quattro. Ms. Rivera. Mr. Rocco. Mrs. Stick. Ms. Taylor. Mrs. Valerio. Mr. Wilcox. Mr. Yolovich. President Adair. No. 9 to 18, amendment fails. Actually, uh, main motion. Is there any other discussion? Thank you, Legislator Lightfoot. Legislator Baroff? Well, I see he went first. He just he yielded to you. No, no, you're up. Okay, you're up. Thank you, Mr. President. You're welcome. I rise uh, to amend the budget for the Sword County Pediatric and Visitation Center funding, and I believe it's going to be. Second by Legislator Morelli. And I will amend. Okay.
Legislator Brock, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome. One of the most vulnerable populations we represent, children, need our support, and our budget needs to better reflect this as a priority. We are deeply troubled by the decision to outsource nine positions at the Supervised Visitation Center, a program for children and families who are going through some incredibly difficult circumstances that simply cry out for sustained and consistent support. At the public forum at our uh, last Human Services Committee meeting, this body was heard through them of, uh, from parents, foster parents, and even from one child who received services from the Visitation Center. And these individuals spoke passionately about the outstanding services that they received from county employees. They spoke of the good work being done, and they even actually highlighted an area the county ought to be pointing at with pride and further supporting. They should be getting more funds rather than less funds. Children in these programs have faced terrible trauma, and in fact, the visitations with their birth parents can be very stressful and for them, very terrifying. I think we all recognize that because they're coming from very bad situations. These foster children often have a difficult time trusting and bonding, and I like to emphasize that, bonding with the social service workers with whom they come into contact. And many parents have in fact relayed their concerns that breaking these bonds and bringing in outsiders, and I don't mean that in the negative sense, but the children, they're outsiders, they're new, will be detrimental for the children. And as we've heard many times, you know, our budget is in fact, it's a difficult process. It is a statement of priorities. It does in fact, you know, have, I don't want to say winners or losers, but where we de develop funds and where we don't. And the fact of the matter is, when we asked about the savings that would, be, would result from transferring these positions to, a private, to the private sector, the projection was less than $200,000. Now I know for me personally, that's a lot of money. But for us as a county, that is a relatively small amount of money. And I really cannot see how that outweighs the potential harm. And I would dare say, if we're looking into the future, so I can't say for a fact, but there will be harm resulting from the change of services for children in the foster care system. This year's budget transfers about coincidentally $200,000 of hotel motel resources from the Greater Rochester Sports Authority, which is a non-functioning, really pass-through local authority, to Sports Development Corporation. And back in 2012, that allocation was actually increased by $125,000 for an upcoming PGA tournament in 2013 at the time. And now the administration seeks to increase this allocation even further, even though the PGA and the LSPGA will no longer be held in Rochester. We asked for and received a list of, of events that are going to be coming to Monroe County as a result of these funding. And the fact is, even though I find value as someone who appreciates sports in Quidditch, if I'm forced to choose between providing a foster care system that provides consistent caring support for our children in Quidditch, I'm going to come down the side of the foster care. This proposed amendment reflects that priority, and I'd urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to consider voting for this. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Boyce. I hadn't planned to speak, but with regards to this uh, motion, at first blush, I too was concerned. But after hearing the testimony of our deputy, our commissioner, Kelly Reed, I learned some things that I hadn't actually considered before. And I find that the basic direct conflict that was presented by Ms. Reed was most compelling. And I can, I can understand our, our DHS uh, workers are there to investigate at times when these child are, children are removed from their homes. And I find that her testimony um, actually compelled me to say that this is an inappropriate um, place for our child care workers to be doing the visitation as well. So based on that, as much as I you know, appreciate the offer that you're making tonight, I would feel more comfortable that an outside agency would be doing these visitation um, work for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Legislator Barack. Thank you. Um, I, I must say thank you um, to uh, my colleague who spoke for this amendment. I, I appreciate that in and of itself. That is, that is um, it's very meaningful, I believe. Um, and in response to the concern or, uh, of regarding um, the conflicts of interest um, that our um, human services director pointed out, I would only offer that every company, government, any entity has the potential for conflicts of interest. And many of them manage to deal with these conflicts of interest in-house by making sure that different individuals report to different authorities who in fact um, 
provide um, uh, safety against those conflicts of interest, and that's what we have controls for. So I do appreciate that this is a concern. Uh, I think it's something that we can, and in fact, probably in the past, I would su suggest have done so successfully in past years. That being said, I think that the overarching concern needs to be with pro appropriate controls in place that we provide consistent caring support for our foster children. And I, I like to emphasize the word consistency because really during this difficult period of time, which can go for years, um, these children are bombarded with new faces almost every meeting they go to. And I, and I, I speak to this not because you're doing something wrong by having different agency work with the students, but because from their point of view, that's a challenge. And so I would suggest that we could perhaps prevent this conflict of interest concern in-house, although I appreciate the fact that you know that is a concern and that could be a motivating factor. I, however, do not agree that it is an overriding factor. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion at this time? On the amendment, I'll move to a roll call vote. On the amendment, Mr. Tucciarello. Present. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Present. Mr. Barra. Present. Ms. Boyce. Present. Dr. Carbone. Present. Mr. Colby. Present. Mr. Danielli. Present. Mr. Delahanty. Present. Mrs. Draw. Present. Mr. Gamble. Present. Mr. Gamina. Mr. Haney, Mr. Howland, Ms. Cayley, Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot, Mr. Marionetti, Mr. Michike, Mr. Morelli, Dr. Quattro, Ms. Rivera, Mr. Rocco, Mrs. Stick, Ms. Taylor, Mrs. Valerio, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Yolovich, President Adair. No. 9 to 19, amendment fails. Back to the main motion. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Lightfoot, John Lightfoot. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to uh, rise to explain my vote. And I just want to say that um, I disagree, uh, and I'm a firm believer of uh, child care subsidies. And um, Mr. President, and to my legislators and to the um, administration on this, um, we, we cut $600,000. Last year, we cut uh, $1.5 million. So it's a total of $2.1, about a million dollars a year uh, from our budget and, um, and child care subsidies. And I do know that we did get close to somewhere between seven, eight million dollars last year back from the government, uh, from the state. Um, I think it was because of some type of cap that we, we had on, on some mandates. And we also received um, dollars from the Medicaid swap. So um, I think that there was ample opportunity for us to be able to um, put back some of these subsidies, if not all, into our budget. And um, I just wanted to say that and explain my vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Morelli. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to explain my vote. It has been said that a budget is a statement of our priorities, the promise that we as elected officials make to the people of our community the men and women who have put their faith and trust in us to build a community that they would want to live in. The budget is a statement of our priorities, and our county executive has shown where her priorities are, not in that of children of the future of our community, not in that of the poor and vulnerable of our community, but rather in making sure that she and her friends are lawyered up in the face of corruption and continue to tote her, her non-increase in taxes when all of our constituents know that is far from reality. We need this administration to make some commitments to more financially sound decisions in county government. Year after year, we defer more, defer more payments uh, to the state pension plan that will cost county taxpayers millions of dollars. 
This administration needs to commit to funding for social services that our citizens need. And this administration needs to commit to finally giving our social workers a contract that they not only need, but downright deserve. This budget is a statement of our priorities, Mr. President. It screams that Monroe County's priorities are way off. My fellow colleagues, let us show the people of this community that they are important to us, every single one of them, young and old, rich and poor, and that we believe in financial reforms and that we are committed to making them. I encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to do as I will do and vote against this budget that simply does not reflect our priorities. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Is there any discussion at this time? Senator Kaley. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to explain my vote. Um, it, I will not be supporting the budget for reasons that have already been stated by other legislators here in the, in the uh, chambers. I am disappointed um, that we cannot re reinstate the level of child care funding where it should be. And um, I'm disappointed in the vote that we had tonight. Not to repeat that we have our, rep our priorities are off kilter, they are off kilter. But I think I, I speak almost more to the article that appeared, um, I think as recently as this morning in, in the DNC where um, our executive made a number of statements that I just found ex extremely um, uncomfortable and not acceptable that we would be adopting as is. We are in fact adopting as is, but with very little, um, very little input on how to make it a better budget because I believe that we presented two amendments that made this a better budget and would assist in helping the entire community in uh, an uplift of what's needed and decreasing costs down the road in any number of ways. The um, state's increased funding for child care is now amounting to a budget fix. What was put in has now allowed the county to take out what they had been supplying. So the maintenance of effort has been supplanted and uh, we don't get to add children to the rolls. We just keep, keep the numbers flat. One of our speakers tonight spoke about feeling the pinch and that was in the article as well. Anyone that has to accept assistance for anything is always feeling a pinch. That's a given. And when you expect or hope for assistance going forward because you hear that our funding is going up, you realize that the pinch is again now hitting more people. Regardless of revamping at the state level, which has been um, what we've been given as the way that we can fix things for child care subsidies and other um, human services funding, I feel that Monroe County had a chance to step up and lead in this. And um, this body voted that potential to be a leader in revising our poverty level our lack of jobs, our, our lack of support for so much of the general population that is growing that it is very disappointing to me for this evening. We've stood here and offered amendments that have been probably up to 14, up to midnight, but this particular vote this evening is probably even more disappointing than last year and I will not be supporting this budget. Thank you. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, before doing so, however, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude uh, to Mr. Franklin and his staff for the efforts that went into the production of the budget for bearing with uh, the legislature's inquiries and questions during the cycle of, of committee meetings. I feel that Mr. Franklin was most forthright and, and honest with us and, and comprehensive in providing information and response to our questions. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, 
two reasons. One, I am very disappointed by the cut in, in daycare. And I think that's a serious mistake and represents a serious misstatement of what the county's priorities are. But I will also be voting against the budget because of what I continue to feel, and these aren't new issues, but I continue to feel are some serious flaws in, in, in the budget. Once again, the county budget contains no money uh, for pay raises for county em employees. Uh, some people might cheer that fact. But we all know that at some point in time, we will be entering into settlements with the various unions that have contracts pending. And that we will be granting at least modest, uh, probably modest pay increases. But there's no money in this budget to fund those, those pay increases. And once again, we're deferring, is, is a polite way of saying, just choosing not to budget for and pay a very large segment of our pension costs. We may like the pension costs or we may dislike them, but the fact is that they are, they exist, they're real. Quite frankly, anybody can balance a budget if you simply don't pay all your bills. Any household, there isn't a householder in this county that couldn't balance their household budget if they just chose to ignore the RG&E bill or some other bill. And we're just choosing to ignore, and I, I realize that it's illegal, but that doesn't mean, mean it's rational. We're just choosing to ignore $19 million of pension costs. Over the last four or five years, we've deferred, uh, as of the end of last year, $53 million of pension costs. That bill is beginning to come due, Mr. Mr. President. It had, those deferrals have to be re repaid in, in increments, and they have to be repaid with interest. The state isn't giving us free money. They're, they're, they've said to us, and I think foolishly on their part, that we don't have to pay, pay the bill now, but we have to pay it in the future, and we have to pay it with interest. It's either pay the, pay the piper now or pay the p piper in the future with interest. And having deferred already as of last December 53 million, this December we'll probably pile on top of that another 20 million of deferrals. And now to say that we're gonna pile on another 19 million of, of, of deferrals, we are just building a path to fiscal destruction. The odd thing is, a great many of us in this chamber won't be here. I won't be here when the shoe drops. But some group of people are gonna be sitting at these, these desks, and I pity the position they're gonna find them, that themselves in. Similarly, the budget is, is balanced by virtue of planning to sell an additional $9,265,000 of tax liens. Is that legal? Certainly it is. Is it wise? I don't believe so, because it's pulling revenue from future years into this year. Well, axiomatically, if you pull the revenue into this year, it won't be in the out year. So that this, this budget, Mr. President, is basically balanced on, on wishes and, 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 and hopes and deferrals. And as I say, anybody could balance their household budget by simply refusing to pay all their bills but that's not gonna get them very far. And as for the fact of holding the tax line, 
Yes, the general property tax rate remains flat, but of course there's county, there's, there's the second county property tax. This, this, the chargeback line or this county services line, or we have the, the various names for it. The revenue to be derived, and we'll, I'll discuss this more in greater detail when we get to the levy ordinances later this evening. But the revenue to be derived from the county from the county services levies on the tax bill is going up next year by over two million dollars. It's going up by five point two seven percent. Most of the taxpayers in this county will get county tax bills that will in fact be higher than this year's tax bill. Those in a few towns will, will see lower bills, actually. But most will see higher bills. So that the fact that to say we're holding taxes flat at 890, at, uh, at, at, the, uh, at, at the current level, but only, but only really be referring to one of the two county taxes I think is grossly mis misleading. So, Mr. President, I will be voting against the budget. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Barat. Thank you, Mr. President. I, too, rise to explain my vote, although I will do it more briefly simply because, um, in, well, in honor of the time, but more specifically because I think many of the things my colleagues have spoken about are a whole, I hold dear to my heart. Um, the, the things about this budget I don't care for, there's some things I like, but overall, my, I guess my main concern I'm going to point out now is that while the, if you look on, you know, on the summary page of the budget, it talks about how the non-mandated um, fees have only gone up by 1.5 percent, and that's a wonderful thing. But if you look down the line, the non-mandated user fee supported fees have gone up an additional 10.7 percent. Um, and those fees and those bills, as my colleague, um, Legislator Haney mentioned, you know, they come to, you know, taxpayers in the same envelope, on the same sheet of paper, they're on the same thing, they all go to the same bottom line. The bottom line is, our tax increase, if you want to call it a tax or a user fee, and I recall an evening here, um, we had a committee meeting last year about the excruciating detailed differences between what a fee is and what a tax is, and the fact is, it's all semantics. What we pay is what we pay. And the bottom line is, we're going to be paying significantly more this year than we did last year. And I don't want to throw a percentage on it, but it's much more than 1.5%, it's not too much lower than 10.7% lower, but still higher than we might like to think about. We will end up paying these, you know, these bills down the road, and down the road's coming pretty quick, and I can't in good conscience vote for this. I realize in all 99.99999% likelihood it will pass, of course, but I can't vote for it, and I'm sorry I can't support it. I realize a lot of work ran into it, and I will, I will second uh, Legislator Haney's remarks regarding the professionalism and the um, often frankness of the materials and information we did receive this year. I am I'm ecstatic about that. And as a result, many people came to me today, not many, several people came to me today and said, we're going to have a short budget meeting. And in fact, you know, it's before 8 o'clock. It's a short budget meeting. And it's relatively <laughs> straightforward. Well, we could keep talking, but I don't I don't no, continue. To. The floor is uh, yours. Thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not a good thing that this is so calm and, and brief. You know, it, it's better than yelling and screaming, I, I acknowledge. But it's not a good thing that we're not having, you know, a, a productive debate. It's not a good thing that we don't have a productive give and take in our deals. And I recognize that, you know, we, we live in a system <coughs> that, that's challenging, and I, and I get that. And I'm not um, questioning, uh, you know, that you know, we, we have um, different priorities, and I'm not questioning that you know, there are different validities around those. But what I am questioning is that what we, we look at this evening as being a productive and a good and, and, and an efficient one, and I wonder if that's really good for us. And I, and I'm, I think that we might want to think about that a little bit. Is it good that we sit here and get through quickly? Or is it better that we stay at midnight and go, oh my God, it's nearly midnight. Sometimes maybe it's a little bit better for us. I don't know. But I have to vote against it. And all good cause, I'm with you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, I'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Tuccarello, you'd like to have the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <coughs> I like legislator Jacques Barat. And I, and I believe in what some of the things he said, uh, specifically um, about having good discussions. 
And uh, I sat here through all the committee weeks, uh, through the committee week, and listened to all the discussion. It was hours and hours of discussions and questions. And, and I feel that we did our service uh, through those hours of work, uh, and today is the day uh, that we uh, make a decision. So I'm glad uh, that he feels that way. I do too. I think we've covered that uh, through committees, and, and I'm happy for that. Um, no one is saying that subsidized daycare is a bad thing or that it's unimportant to provide at-risk, low-income families with help to transition from welfare to the workplace. This is important. Child care is not being cut. It's increasing. Thanks to the work of Senator Robach, our community will see a total increase in child care of about $500,000. Anyone saying child care in Monroe County is being cut is being disingenuous. This year, Monroe County will spend $4.2 million, $4.2 million in local tax dollars on subsidized daycare, which is 400% more than any other upstate county. Monroe County will spend more this year to support child care than Albany County, Onondaga County, and Erie's counties all combined. The Center for Governmental Research released a study last month about child care subsidies in their conclusions, they noted that state funding has not kept pace in Monroe County, while other counties have received millions more. Mr. President, in this community, under the Brooks administration, and since I've become a legislator in 2006, a flat tax rate has been a number one priority. In most other counties in this state, the property tax rates have continued to climb. Mr. President, we have done more with less every year. We have become more efficient every year, and the residents of Monroe County are better served because of our efforts. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? If not, now I will move to the roll call vote. On the main motion, Mr. Tucciarello? Here. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello? Here. Mr. Barraw? Here. Ms. Boyce? Dr. Carbone. Yes. Mr. Colby. Here. Mr. Danielli. Here. Mr. Delahanty. Here. Mrs. Draw. Here. Mr. Gamble. Here. Mr. Gamina. Mr. Haney. Here. Mr. Howland. Here. Ms. Cayley. Here. Mr. John Lightfoot. Here. Mr. Willie Lightfoot. Mr. Marionetti? Yes. Mr. Michike? Yes. Mr. Morelli? Yes. Dr. Quattro? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Rocco? Yes. Mrs. Stick? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Yes. Mrs. Valerio? Yes. Mr. Wilcox? Yes. Mr. Yolovich? Yes. President Adair? Yes. 19 to 9, budget passes. Thank you. At this time, I would like to recess the full legislative meeting. Thank you.
Legislators, if you please could be seated at this time. Okay, you're fine. All right. Hey, please bear with me. We're going to go, we're going to bounce around a little bit on this agenda, but I think we'll be okay. We will now proceed with item 67 through 75, which is on page 10, which you just got. And then we're going to return to the original agenda. Will the clerk please read the first item? Item number 67, referral 14-0410-BR. Bond resolutions for the 2015 Monroe County Capital Budget. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, it is seconded by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Lightfoot, John Lightfoot. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, to you, Mr. President, can the, um, as I was reading through this, <clears throat> can you tell me that, that why they are two um, resolutions that, to me, uh, reads, reads almost the same, or identically the same uh, to you, Mr. President. It would be on um, res, uh, page 25, uh, project, project referral number 10, and uh, page 13, project referral number five. Um, they both are issuing bonds for countywide infrastructure for uh, electronic data storage and communications. Um, both for two different dollar amounts, and I just would like to know uh, why is that to you, Mr. President? Uh, Mr. President, the difference between these uh, difference between these two projects has to do with uh, the fact that the countywide communications infrastructure is much more broad in focus uh, and also provides for uh, services uh, through county departments, MCC, Monroe Community Library. It's basically our countywide um, information network and telecommunications system, which is now fully integrated into our network. Countywide uh, ERP updates really is more specific to our SAP software. Um, that is the difference, Mr. President. Thank you <coughs> to you, Mr. Chair. And just one, one other question. Se secondly, um, if you could explain the difference between uh, uh, project reference number 15, which is found on page 34, and project reference number 16, which is found on page 37. Both are resolutions um, issuing bonds for <coughs> for various costs of uh, improvements to the countywide uh, highways. To you, Mr. President. Uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, there's there there are projects that are several roads within each project, and there are different roads within each project. Like one has got five streets, the other one's got four streets. So there are, different, there are different ones that we just bundle together based on the type of work that's going on. Thank you, Mr. President. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> Is 66 later in, in the We will be going back to item number 15 
after we get done with so all of these. Yeah. Yes, we're going to go through 67 through 75, and then we're going to go back to 15, back to the regular agenda. Okay. Uh, on item number 67, um, this big package of bond ordinances, I would move to sever project number 31 uh, for a separate vote, which is the frontier field in, in improvements. Uh, being seconded, Mr. Mr. President, I, b I believe it's inappropriate that we be forced to vote on all these significant bond ordinances uh, in a bulk vote, and, I'm, and I would hope that we'd sever thir 31. That doesn't necessarily mean I would vote against 31, but I'd like to have the opportunity to separately consider it. Legislator Haney, I believe that we don't have that privilege to sever that. Sorry? I don't believe we have that privilege to sever out of that capital bond, the capital budget. That's and my that's recollection, unless I'm being told differently, I don't think we can. Madam Speaker? I'm, I'm asking for a separate vote on item 31. Uh, through the president, uh, pursuant to the charter, Immediately after uh, the budget vote, the capital budget is to be voted upon, which includes all of the bond resolutions. And I don't believe we can sever it. That's correct. We can discuss it. We can discuss it. Yeah. Item number 31, if you'd like. But I don't believe we can. I so without severing it, the legislators are prohibited from voting against it unless you vote against all, that every one of them. That Which would be a crazy. correct statement. Am I correct in saying that? Through the president, that is correct. Yeah. We can ask questions on it, Legislator Haney. We can't sever it. You're telling me I can ask questions on it, but I can't vote against it without well, voting against everything. I would appeal the ruling of, of, of the chair pro prohibiting the severing. Okay. Alrighty, um, that's okay. We've got a move and a second to uh, to go against uh, the chairman's uh, interpretation that we have never severed, and I believe it's in our county charter that we can't do that. So I will move to uh, a discussion about it. And if there's no more discuss discussion, then I'll move to the roll call vote. Legislator Light, you're up. I just want to just say this for the record that the move that we're doing. Um, it's just to say that we don't agree with the interpretation of the charter. We don't believe that the charter says you can't do that. It okay. says you have to vote on the CIP. It doesn't tell you how. So I just think that, uh, you know, that's kind of where we stand. Mr. President, thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, again, as I said, my interpretation in, is, is that we can sever the bond. Legislator Wilcox. For you, Mr. President, I'm, I'm slightly confused because I thought we just voted on the capital budget. Is that correct? Not the bond. We're on item number 67. Is that correct, Chairman? Yeah. Which is the bond resolutions for the 2016 Monroe County capital budget. So the bond resolutions themselves, Mr. President, are through you. Is there any prohibition on voting on the bond resolutions separately? Not the entire budget. I can, I can certainly get an interpretation. We right now we have that we're uh, we've got a move in a sec. We got a move in a second against what I determined is the way I interpret it. Right. Um, you've asked another question that's kind of outside of that, but I'll ask for interpretation from our legal staff. Through the president, it would be out of order to sever the capital project, our capital budget. The capital budget is uh, defined as only capital projects for which resolutions have been adopted. And uh, again, to, uh, to state that the capital budget is an element uh, of the proposed annual budget. It is singular. The capital budget includes all of the resolutions that the, that uh, you will be voting on. Okay. Legislator Haney. Mr. President, respect. We've already adopted the capital budget. 
the capital budget is a couple of pages in this thing. We held a vote on this book. That vote. I know, I don't, I'm not, I, can we rule? Hang on, thank you. But Legislator Haney, I, I think we're, we are slightly off base. Right now, we've got before this legislative body something that says, there are people out there that do not agree with my ruling. So let's get that out of the way, and you can talk about whatever you want yeah. after that. Can, can the order, Mr. Chairman, be a point of information, uh, points of order are debatable. So Yes, they are. So I agree. I, I totally think, agree, but I'm just. So I think Mr. Haney's question is completely but, in line with thank yours. Thank you. Thank you. But Legislator Haney, we gotta, let's dispatch what we've got in front of us or let's and go to the next one, but not quickly summarize, Legislator Haney, where you well, want to, what's I your concern? I will summarize. This package is not the capital budget that we've been told can't be broken. And I understand the capital budget can't be broken. This package are, is the financing resolution for the capital budget. It's and not the capital uh, budget. The Legislator capital Haney, budget is in the budget book I, and we've approved it. I believe I got that interpretation from the legal department just now that we cannot do that. But and and they're, they're wrong. this at the same time we vote on the other piece if if it what's the purpose of voting on this separately if it cannot be severed to you mr president to the administration why that extra step you're not the administration thank you it's your ruling we need to vote on that yeah but we're still you know thank you and, and i agree and i want to get to that but Legislator Lightfoot has asked a question that I believe the legal department can answer that rather quickly. Uh, through the president, that's correct. Every, every year for the past uh, several years, uh, this is how we've done it. So uh, past practice is one, one argument, but the other argument is the actual definition of capital budget under C-411, which includes resolutions uh, the capital budget is defined or consists of those projects in the proposed capital budget for which resolutions authorizing the issuance of obligations or other financing resolutions have been adopted by the county legislature. Okay. Now back to we have, we're going to go back now and we're going to rule either with the chair on this or not with the chair on this. I will have our clerk do a roll call vote and we will proceed from that point. Thank you. Yes sustains the rule of the chair. Mr. Tucciarello. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Mr. Baroff. Ms. Boyce. Dr. Carbone. Mr. Colby. Mr. Danielli. Mr. Delahanty. Mrs. Draw. Mr. Gamble. Mr. Gamina. Mr. Haney, Mr. Howland, Ms. Cayley, Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot, Mr. Marionetti, Mr. Michike, Mr. Morelli, Dr. Quattro, Ms. Rivera, Mr. Rocco, Mrs. Stick, Ms. Taylor, Mrs. Valerio, Mr. Wilcox, yes. Mr. Yolovich, yes. President Adair. Yes. 19 to nine, rule of the chair is sustained. Back to the matter before us. Is there any other discussion on the bond? Being none, I'll move to a roll call vote. On the main motion, Correct. Mr. Tucciarello. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Yes. Mr. Baroff. Ms. Boyce. Yes. Dr. Carbone. Yes. Mr. Colby. Yes. Mr. Danielli. Yes. 
Mr. Delahanty? Yes. Mrs. Draw? Yes. Mr. Gamble? Yes. Mr. Gamina? Mr. Haney? Mr. Howland? Ms. Cayley? Mr. John Lightfoot? Mr. Willie Lightfoot? Mr. Marionetti? Mr. Michike? Mr. Morelli? Dr. Quattro? Ms. Rivera? Mr. Rocco? Mrs. Stick? Ms. Taylor? Mrs. Valerio? Mr. Wilcox? Mr. Yolovich? President Adair? Yes. 28 to 0, capital budget passes. Next item, please. Item number 68, referral 14 0411. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, is second by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this point? Hearing none, all those. Oh, 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 oh. Legislator Haney. Uh, on item 68, Ms. Mr. President, could we just have, we're being asked to reallocate 12 and a half, as I understand it, 12 and a half million dollars in the 2014 budget. Could we have just a brief explanation uh, on, on the reallocations, what's driving the reallocation? Mr. President, um, we actually talked about this a little bit during the budget process in the committee hearings. Um, the majority of this uh, referral relates to um, this legislative body appropriating revenues related to the upper payment limit, which would support the local share of that, uh, that payment itself. Um, appropriating the revenues of roughly $17 million to support the $8.9 million upper payment limit. The bulk, that is the bulk of it. The re remainder of the referral relates to um, recognizing and appropriating the revenues attributable to uh, safety net assistance appropriations or family assistance appropriations. Through, through the chair, so we're not actually re reallocating appropriations, we're increasing revenues <coughs> and, appro and appropriations, is that what we're doing? It's, it's a growth, a, a net increase in, in the budget? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you are, you are correct. We are not actually um, transferring appropriations, this referral recognizes and appropriates the revenues that will be received. Uh, most of these revenues are formula based on mandated expenses such as Medicaid and public assistance benefits. So f through, through the chair, for example, the two thirds of this money is the 8,863,000 at Monroe Community Hospital. What has occurred that is generating an extra $8,800,000 of revenue at Monroe Community Hospital? Mr. President, that would be the um, state mandated Medicaid portion, which represents the upper payment limit. Monroe County has to bear the entire local share of that payment, 50% of uh, $17 million in change. Uh, the local share, therefore, is roughly $8.9 million. Just for clarity, Mr. President, uh, members here may recall this as being IGT, the Intergovernmental Transfer. Right. I, I realize that in the 2015 budget that the, what we would call as the IGT payment is in the uh, community hospital budget. My recollection was that in the 2014 and prior year budgets, the cost of the IGT payment or reimbursement, whatever you want to call it to the state, was in the general fund bu budget. 
it had been mr president in prior years through conversations with state deal which representatives and the federal government center for medicare and medicaid studies it became apparent that it is allowable for local governments to remit payment of the local share of this upl from its hospital enterprise fund so through the chair we're implementing the policy that was sort of retroactive it was in 2014 to recognize the intergovernmental share thing in the hospital fund what becomes of the appropriation in the general fund that we approved in the 2014 budget mr president is remaining within the department of human services so is that in effect now being used to balance the books of the department of human services for other expenditures mr president that appropriation would be available for the portion of the public assistance benefits that not is not covered under this referral which would be the portion that is not reimbursable by state or federal revenues well i think we need to recognize through through you mr president i think we need to recognize that while it certainly is appropriate to to create this and 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 report it in the hospital fund that we're actually by by freeing up the appropriation already approved in in the general fund at at some risk i i would say i think we're in we're engaging at least slightly in in some slate of hand financially in creating a cushion which will form an appropriation in the general fund thank you is there any other discussion seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying i opposed the item carries next item please item number 69 referral 14-0412 confirming moved by legislator mitch a case second by a legislator delahanty is there any discussion at this time seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying i opposed the item carries next item please item number 70 referral 14-0413 moved by the legislator yolovich it is seconded by legislator rocco is there any discussion at this time seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying i opposed the item carries next item please item number 71 referral 14-0414 moved by legislator yolovich is seconded by legislator rocco is there any discussion at this time seeing none all those in favor indicate by saying i opposed the item carries next item please item number 72 referral 14-0415 moved by legislator yolovich it is seconded by legislator rocco is there any discussion at this time legislator haney thank you mr president um i noted on the document we received earlier today from the clerk um about the town budgets uh on the last page regarding the town of rush um it the way this document is set it set up its appropriations less revenues less unexpended balances is the levy to be raised by a tax and i noticed for the town of rush the amount in the less unexpended balances column the amounts are in parentheses whereas all the other towns they're 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 not the fact that they're in parentheses for the town of rush would tend to indicate that it's the reverse of less unexpended um balances i know that's a complex question but um do you know the document i'm referring to mr franklin i mean it 
may just be a typo in President, the documents we're looking at does not have parentheses around the town of Rush. Could it be a different document? Could be. Would you like, would you like the document? It, it was distributed by the clerk's office today. Mr. President, uh, although this document has parentheses around those two sets of numbers, uh, the math still works to the bottom line that is in the uh, referral and resolution. So the, obviously my point in, in raising it was I was concerned as to whether there was some kind of a technical amendment that was needed to this resolution. Uh, but, but but I take it your answer is no. Uh, uh, Mr. President, our opinion is, is no. Thank you. So your opinion at this time is that we do not need to make a correction to it, that the copy that you have, which will be distributed very quickly after this meeting to everybody, would clearly state that the town of Rush is not getting a Christmas present from us. Is that correct? Uh, you are correct. No technical amendment. The uh, resolution that will be signed is accurate. Okay. Thank you. Legislator Haney, are you okay with that? We good with that? I trust him too, so I'm sure we'll get a corrected copy really quick. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 73, referral 14-0416. It is moved by Legislator Yolovich. It is second by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 74, referral 14-0417. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, second by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this time? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item, please. Item number 75, referral 14 0418. Moved by Legislator Rocco, second or Yolovich, second by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I believe, Mr. President, that this the item in which we levy the county services charges, is that correct? It's correct, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, I would just like to note for the record, Mr. President, um, <clears throat> we're s uh, so enormously proud of talking about holding taxes flat, uh, of what uh, the surprises that uh, some of our county residents are, are going to see when they receive their tax bills on, on January the 2nd. Uh, for us, uh, um, just a quick review of the breakdown uh, by, by town, uh, that while there are some towns that indeed are winners in 
in next year's county services levy game. There are some towns that are significant losers um, and people might want to brace their constituents in some of these areas uh, for these, these changes. I would just note for the record, uh, Mr. President, for example, that in the town of Penfield, the county services levy next year is going up by 17.72%. Uh, in the town of Parenton, the county services levy next year is going up by 20.58%. And in the town of Pittsford, the county services levy next year is going up by 34.3%. Uh, now the actual uh, increase that individual people see in their bills will be less than those percentages because of course some of it is being increased, absorbed by increased assessments. Uh, but uh, as, as we proudly talk about holding uh, taxes flat, we I think m just as, pro uh, just as uh, importantly need to note that some of our county residents are gonna see significant increases in their county services levy uh, next next year. Thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? Legislator Tuscarella. Um, thank you, Mr. President. To, uh, to Legislator Haney's point, um, I would like to say that the towns of Penfield, Parenton, and Pittsburgh, you know, all have had uh, new house construction that does increase the tax uh, base, obviously, um, and so it would, it would absorb that. discussion at this time. If not, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. The next item will be on your agenda. It is item number 15. When you're ready, Madam Clerk. <clears throat> item number 15, referral 14-0319. Moved by the Honorable Robert J. Colby and seconded by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Haney. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. At the risk of um, um, overstaying my welcome or something this evening. <laughs> the well. <laughs> Well, look on the bright side of things, Mr. President. In a year, you'll be rid of me. <laughs> and me too. <laughs> the, um, I rise to explain my, my vote on, on, on this issue. I'm, I'm gonna be voting in the negative for two reasons. One, I have, I have some concern about um, this is especially in the, in the uh, public corporation arena is, is an old argument about whether people who regularly have to go to Wall Street for financing as opposed to their neighborhood bank or something uh, can, can do it and get as favorable a reception using uh, a local or a regional accounting firm as opposed to using a national firm. And indeed, to some, to some extent, the national firms have, have milked that issue over the years. Uh, but I, I have some lingering concern that um, we may be creating some slight disadvantage for us, for ourselves. Um, in, in selling the large blocks of bonds that we have to periodically sell on Wall Street uh, by not using a national accounting firm. But the second reason uh, that I'll be voting no is I have some concern uh, about um, the experience the county has had with the particular firm that we're being asked to select this evening to approve this evening. Um, there's a, the relationship between an audit firm and a client is, is a somewhat unusual one. The client obviously hires an 
and can fire uh, the auditing firm any time it chooses to do so. Uh, the auditing firm is, just, is thus uh, so, sort of in, in the precarious position, uh, sometimes is placed in the precarious position that if they really sincerely do what they're supposed to do, their client will fire them, throw them out the door. Uh, having s spent uh, 14 years in public accounting, uh, it, it creates tense situations. And indeed, I've seen situations in which public accounting firms have had to make some very difficult decisions and in effect have done things that they knew, uh, have issued audit reports that they knew would result in the termination of, of their services. Um, the, and I have to say, Ms. Mr. President, that I'm, I'm concerned uh, about what, if, if, if a situation should arise where in the professional judgment of the people we're selecting tonight, um, whether they would be able uh, to withstand the pressure that clients can, can bring um, uh, on auditing firms to in effect, to in fact do, do the right thing. And of course, I'm alluding to the situation that was well documented and arose four or five years ago involving <coughs> uh, an audit, I believe it was, of, of Fanita uh, by the firm of, of Bonadio, where uh, under some documented pressure, uh, Bonadio backed off and changed what they had intended to do in an audit report. And I find that troubling, Ms. Mr. President, and I think it sets a wrong tone uh, for moving forward, and therefore I will vote against this proposal. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion at this time? On item number 15, I'll move to a roll call vote. Mr. Tucciarello. Yes. Ms. Andrews is excused. Mr. Ancello. Mr. Barath. Ms. Boyce, Dr. Carbone, Mr. Colby, yes. Mr. Daniele, yes. Mr. Delahanty, yes. Mrs. Draw, yes. Mr. Gamble, yes. Mr. Gamina, Mr. Haney, yes. Mr. Howland, Ms. Cayley, yes. Mr. John Lightfoot, Mr. Willie Lightfoot, Mr. Marionetti, Mr. Michike, Mr. Morelli, Dr. Quattro, Ms. Rivera, Mr. Rocco, Mrs. Stick, Ms. Taylor, Mrs. Valerio, Mr. Wilcox, Mr. Yolovich, President Adair. Yes. 25 to 3, referral passes. Next item. Item Legislative number. President. Legislator Tutorello. I would uh, like to rise to make a motion uh, to move items number 16 through 61. Second. I have a motion made and a second by Legislator Lightfoot. That is all the way through 61. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Thank you. Next item. Item number 62, referral 14 0367. Moved by Legislator Michikade, is second by Legislator Yolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? <coughs> Legislator Wilcox. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, you may recall I actually had some questions about this uh, referral at EPW. Um, 
several of those questions actually were answered by the administration um, in writing today, and I appreciate that. Uh, but through you, Mr. President, um, at EPW, I asked about former Majority Leader Smith's referral of 2006, which I believe was referred to the administration, requesting that the county administration would identify opportunities for additional uses of the countywide fiber optic network, including leasing excess capacity. Um, those questions were not acknowledged in the responses from the administration. So uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to ask if the administration ever did identify opportunities um, or establish a business plan as requested by minority, or ma I'm sorry, Majority Leader Smith in his 2006 referral. And if not, um, why wasn't that done? And I believe it's germane because there's some aspects of the referral that if this was done, it would be redundant. Through you, Mr. President, to the best of our knowledge, there was never one done. Thank you. Any other discussion at this time? Seeing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 63. 63. 63. Uh, referral 14-0370. Moved by Legislator Marinetti, second by Legislator Ancello and Rolovich. Is there any discussion at this time? Seeing none on 63, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The item carries. Next item. Item number 64, referral 14-0370. Moved by Legislator Yolovich, it is second by Legislator Rocco. Is there any discussion at this time? Legislator Quattro. Through you, Mr. Chairman, the resolution that you have before you uh, has the effective change included Thank you very in much, it. Mr. President. Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. President. Um, since the uh, resolutions were passed um, as a group, I did want to point out on number 42 as well as number 44, there's mention of Coordinated Care Service Incorporated, and I'd like to declare my interest on both of those, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You have done so. Back to item number 64. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The item carries. There is no unfinished business tonight. However, I believe I have a plaque to present. Would Legislator Rivera please come up and I'd like to just say a few words um, on behalf of the entire legislature that I want to thank you for your service here. I, it's been an honor to serve with you. Um, you, have, you have done well representing your constituents. You, even as a young legislator, a lot of times some people say that it takes a whole year before you can really kind of get your wheels underneath you and get going. And, and sometimes even second an emotion can be 
uh, a traumatic experience. You hit the ground running. And you did a very nice job. And we would like to present this plaque to you, Leslie, tonight in honor of your time here. You will definitely, I hope, continue to serve the community because I think you have a bright and articulate voice for that. And I look forward to hearing from you in the time to come. Today. So here you go. Thank you. That was more than enough. Um, I just want to thank this legislative body for allowing me to be a part of it, um, my caucus members for um, bringing me in and teaching me and guiding me through this process. Um, I never imagined to, be, to have served in public office. Um, when I started my journey in education, I thought that that was my goal was to serve children and to advocate for them at that level. And, and as I continued and furthered my education, I realized that advocacy um, for me was going to be more than just within children. And this allowed me that opportunity to do so. I've worked in the community um, for several years and this just allowed me to work for my constituents in a different capacity. I will continue to work in the community and continue to serve um, my district and and the people that helped me to get here. So again, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to spend a privilege and an honor. Thank you Before I wish everyone well good I'm sure in this meeting too before I wish everyone all the the goodness parts of this holiday. I would like to turn over the podium to County Executive Maggie Brooks. And I believe she has a, uh, she has a few words she would like to speak about. Well, thank you very much, President Adair, and thank you to the legislators who are here tonight. Um, first of all, I wanna say that this is kind of a sad night for those of us uh, in the administration, um, we are saying goodbye to a long time member of our team. Uh, Dan DeLoss started with me in 2004 as the county attorney, and since 2009 has been serving as my deputy county executive. Dan is a talented and principled leader um, who has embraced and promoted the core values and the high standards of our team. He has been a trusted advisor and has guided uh, county operations with much integrity and great passion. His commitment to excellence has been a part of our community's success and I thank him. As a public servant, Dan has always put service above self. So tonight, uh, I would like to thank him publicly uh, in front of this body with a special proclamation. So Dan, if you would come up here. And the proclamation reads that Dan DeLoss Jr. has been a prominent fixture in the operation of Monroe County government since his service as county attorney began in 2004. Before joining this administration, he worked as an attorney in private practice and also served as an assistant public defender with the Monroe County Public Defender's Office from 1987 to 1992. Dan was named Deputy County Executive in December of 2009 and has earned a reputation as a dedicated and respected leader. Dan's service doesn't end when he leaves the county office building each day. He's an active and engaged member of his community. Currently, he is chairman of the Town of Penfield Zoning Board of Appeals. He serves on the board of directors for the Bavona Child Advocacy Center. Dan is a past member of the Town of Penfield Planning Board and a past president of the County Attorneys Association of the State of New York. It talks about Dan's um, educational career um, and some of his hobbies in his free time uh, that include hitting the links, coaching youth softball and baseball, and cheering on his favorite team, the Fighting Irish. So it is truly an honor for me tonight to distinguish Dan as an individual who has dedicated his career to enhancing the quality of life for all of those who call Monroe County home. His exemplary record of service speaks volumes 
to his commitment to others. As a leader and trusted advisor, he puts service above self every day. Dan's legacy, passion, and tireless dedication will live on through his many lasting contributions to the County of Monroe, our entire community, and those who are fortunate enough to call him a colleague and a friend. Appropriately, we today celebrate Dan's outstanding service and wish him the best as he serves and begins a new chapter in his life. So today, Dan, we do this for a lot of people, but we are recognizing and honoring you. Dan DeLoss Jr., it is your day. You have a few hours left. And uh, <laughs> we can't give everybody a full day. Um, and we thank you for your distinguished career of dedicated service to the County of Monroe. And Dan will begin his new service on January 6th at the Greater Rochester Transit Authority. So congratulations, Dan. Thank you so much, Maggie, and it's a late night, so I'll, I'll do my best to be brief, although uh, I still am a lawyer, folks, so I haven't forgotten that. Um, but let me just say my, my uh, 11 years now with the county, this time with the county, because I'm certainly very proud of the years I spent at the public defender's office, as Maggie has pointed out. Uh, but this time with the county, uh, those years have been fun and they've been very fulfilling, and I truly mean that. And I would say... Um, that, that it starts at the top, Maggie, and, and, and I have to tell you, um, I, I, I don't think there are very many people that understand how hard your job is. And I have seen it day in and day out, um, really for all 11 years, but being closer physically to you and, and the, our offices, uh, I see it, I hear it, and I know what you go through day in and day out, and I, and, and I am convinced that this community is better off because of you and because of the things that you have done. And I mean that sincerely, and, and that's my opinion, but it's based upon what people have told me, what I have heard people say to other people, and um, what I've heard them say about you. And it's been, it, it's humbling to have played a small role in that, and it's something forever uh, uh, to you I will, be gr I will be grateful for, Maggie, and I really, I really mean that. Um, I am going to miss the legislature meetings. And uh, especially the budget ones. I really am. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you why, because I admire your advocacy on both sides of the aisle. I truly do. It's something that, that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. Advocates should fight, and, and you all fight. Um, but you also um, realize at the end of the day that we're all citizens, we're all human beings. And you do your best work when you keep that in mind, and I would encourage you to always do that. So be proud of the work that you do, because you should be. It's, it's good work. The, the, the men and women with whom I've worked for 11 years couldn't ask um, for a better group of people. And, I, and, and luckily in my job, I've gotten to know many, not, certainly not uh, even the majority, but many of the 4,500 employees we have at the county. And I can tell you what, there, there's no harder working group of people and in this day and age, we all know that government employees, um, they're not on the top of list of, uh, of praise for people, but they should be. They work very, very hard, and I'm proud um, to call them my coworkers and, and, and my friends. And on that last line, friends, I, I've made many, uh, and I hope uh, I'm not going all that far away. In fact, I'm born and raised in this community. I'm going to stay here, um, and, and, and I'll continue the relationships. I'm going to be here for another month, so it's holiday time and it'll be time for some uh, holiday cheer. Thank you all very much for the opportunity, and I appreciate the moment and the, and the talk. It's very good. Everyone have a happy holiday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, colleagues, I want to say to you all tonight, we are done. Um, please have a happy and joyous holidays with your family and your friends. Um, take a time to re, uh, reflect on how lucky we all are and how fortunate we are um, with what we have. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Tucciarella.
Very well said, Mr. President. The next mm. meeting of the Monroe County Legislature is scheduled for Tuesday, January 13th, 2015 at 6 p.m. We are adjourned.